And I was interviewing the, uh, another Nobel laureate, a guy named Leon Letterman, who ran the Fermi National Laboratory. And Leon told me that he liked to walk around the laboratory at night and talk to the graduate students because they hadn't learned how to lie yet. And so this was a learning experience. And, you know, again, we end up like these researchers, they, 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 they do the experiment, they gather the data, they interpret the data, they write a paper, the paper gets reviewed, they rewrite it, it gets published, and then we read the newspaper account, which makes it look like this sort of white or black thing they discovered X or they didn't discover X. And the truth is that even the people who discovered it often can't decide among them whether or not they really discovered it. And the people who know the most about whether they might have discovered it aren't the heads of the experiments and the guys who win the Nobel Prizes. They're the technicians who actually built the equipment and said, would say to me, like, my equipment can't do what they think it does. It's not good enough. Thank you to Timeline for sponsoring this episode of the show. Timeline Nutrition is pioneering science. And in fact, they make one of my all-time favorite products. They make a product called MitoPure. And MitoPure is the first and only clinically tested urolithin A. What is urolithin A that you're asking? It is a postbiotic that our guts typically make. It's a metabolite. And actually, 60 to 70% of people can't even make the appropriate amount of urolithin A. Urolithin A is important and works along some of the same pathways as exercise and calorie restriction. Essentially, it helps the mitochondria turn over and induce mitophagy and improve the mitochondria health. And why do you care about that? Because you care about your overall health and well-being and you care about muscle health. If you have not tried MitoPure, please go to TimelineNutrition.com slash Dr. Lion and you will get 10% off your order. That is TimelineNutrition.com slash Dr. Lion or use the code Dr. Lion to get 10% off. Gary Tobbs. You are an absolute legend, and I'm so grateful that you are joining us and going to share your wisdom and your perspective. Certainly, medical journalism and journalism in and of itself is an ancient art and one that is absolutely necessary. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, now, you have a new book out. You've written many books. Uh, yeah, the new book is Rethinking Diabetes, uh, and it's kind of, I, I have this problem when I write books, which is I'm fascinated by how we came to believe what we believe and whether or not it's right. So I tend to take a historical perspective to go back and look at the evidence, and, uh, and, and then I get carried away, and the result is a book like Rethinking Diabetes. So. I uh, can't. I um. I can't wait to hear what your next book is going to be on. Uh, the next book is just going to be a similar history of the obesity thinking. You know, because the um, the fundamental one of. I mean, if you were going to divide, say the the virtually everything we think about nutrition, all our concepts in nutrition are based on sort of three fundamental pillars. And the primary pillar is that uh, we get fat because we eat too much. And it seems intuitively obvious, and it's kind of biologically naive. And I've written about this in every one of my books. It's been at least a chapter, if not a theme, but it keeps getting ignored in effect because to say that you don't get fat because you eat too much seems like too much to take on. And I keep thinking... Um, if I write a book only about that and that history, then reviewers and critics can't ignore it. Um, they could ignore the book entirely, which is a likely scenario, but they can't ignore the arguments, which is that when you go back and look at the history, clearly obesity is caused by it. It's a sort of neural hormonal phenomena. Some people are predisposed to become obese. Some people aren't. Um, 
And then the question is what triggers that predisposition? But uh, anyway, that, that'll be the next book. In an ideal world, it's going to be about this concept of how we came to believe that obesity is caused by energy imbalance. And the title I would love to give it is The Biography of a Very Bad Idea. My editor has already rejected that, but that's how I think of the title. So, You know, you do have a very interesting history. Um, again, medical journalism, health journalism is challenging in and of itself, especially for an individual who is not professionally taught. You are very, um, from what I understand, self-taught in biochemistry and some of this literature. Is that is that true? Um, well, when it comes to biochemistry, I would say that I'm just not taught. Um, the <laughs> my background my background was in the hard sciences. I have a physics degree. I got an engineering degree from graduate school. I then decided I wanted to be a journalist. So I got a journalism degree and became an investigative science reporter because as I started reporting about science, I realized that there was a lot of bad science out there. Um, a lot of, just like there's bad plumbers and bad doctors and bad lawyers and people you don't want to hire to do the job they're supposed to do. The world is full of bad science. And because science is so difficult, one way to think about it is we've, we've, you, you discover the easy stuff. You always get the low-hanging fruit and you're left with the hard stuff and the hard stuff is hard because it's hard. So you need the exquisite skills and intellect and, and rigor and meticulous techniques and and like any profession, most people don't have that level of talent. And so a large proportion, maybe even the great proportion of everything that's published is either irrelevant or wrong or misinterpreted or, I mean, pick your <laughs> problem. Um, so I, back in the mid 80s, I tremble to think that I've been working that long. But back in the mid 80s, I had the opportunity to go off to Geneva, Switzerland, to the big physics lab called CERN. Uh, it's the biggest lab in the world. And to follow what I had been told would be a, the greatest breakthrough in physics in 40 years. These people said that guy who would win the Nobel Prize that year said, I just had to turn on my accelerator, get a little more data and nail it down. And I asked him if I could, well, today we would say be embedded with his collaboration. Um, you know, I slept on a ho in a hostel in the laboratory. I spent about 18 hours a day with the physics physicists on the experiment, and I watched them realize that they had screwed up and that there was no discovery. And these very, very, very smart scientists had to deal with the fact that they had embarrassed themselves. And not only had they embarrassed themselves, they embarrassed themselves with the journalists present recording it all for posterity. So the book that I thought was going to be about a great breakthrough turned out to be about uh, a sort of uh, expose about the politics and sociology of this very um, cutting edge high energy physics and I became obsessed with how hard it is to do science right and how easy it is to get the wrong answer. Um, and I've been doing that ever since. It's just physics has an advantage over medicine and nutrition and public health and that you can actually control your experiments. Uh, the experiment I was writing about cost, uh, I don't know, probably a couple hundred million million dollars back then. Today, the equivalent experiments cost $10 billion to do when you have collaborations of 5,000 physicists and they're trying to figure out, you know, exactly what they're doing in these experiments and how to interpret them. In medicine and public health, we have none of that. It's like dealing with people is excruciatingly difficult. Often it's unethical. Um, so you get these hypotheses and you can never really test them well. And as a result, <laughs> human nature sets in and people decide the hypotheses are true anyway. So it's like you have this idea, like the very first big story I did on nutrition was, was about salt and blood pressure. 
And this was the late 90s. And like everyone else, I thought if you ate a salt-rich diet, it would give you hypertension. And so we're all eating low-salt diets. The food was bland beyond belief, but we choked it down. And I stumbled into the realization that there was actually a very vitriolic controversy over whether or not salt consumption sodium actually was the cause of hypertension and whether eating a low salt diet would do any good. And I spent nine months doing an investigation for science on this one magazine article. Science was a journal. It's the, one of the two most prominent science journals in the world. And, um, I interviewed 85. But, how did you, but before you tell us that, I have to stop you because you didn't mention you did go to Harvard and then you went to Stanford and you studied physics. Uh, no big deal. But the switch to health, how was that and why was it the switch to health? Why from physics to then health? Was it that you were just simply sick of eating the bland food or <laughs> was, was there a moment? It. Um the, uh, there was a moment. So after I did this physics book, so again, I start off, I moved to this laboratory. I lived with these physicists for nine months. I watch them realize how they had screwed up their interpretation of the experiment. Um, I learned a lot of lessons in the process. Like there were 150 physicists in this collaboration and then numerous technicians. And, and the collaboration had divided up into two groups the people who only interpreted the evidence that the equipment collected and the people who had actually built the equipment and didn't trust it to do what the other group thought it could do. And while I was doing that ex research, I also traveled around the world to talk to other physicists and I was interviewing the, uh, another Nobel laureate, a guy named Leon Letterman, who ran the Fermi National Laboratory. And Leon told me that he liked to walk around the laboratory at night and talk to the graduate students because they hadn't learned how to lie yet. And so this was a learning experience. And, you know, we, again, we end up like these researchers, they, 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 they do the experiment, they gather the data, they interpret the data, they write a paper, the paper gets reviewed, they rewrite it, it gets published, and then we read the newspaper account which makes it look like this sort of white or black thing. They discovered X or they didn't discover X. And the truth is that even the people who discovered it often can't decide among them whether or not they really discovered it. And the people who know the most about whether they might have discovered it aren't the heads of the experiments and the guys who win the Nobel Prizes. They're the technicians who actually built the equipment and said, would say to me, like, my equipment can't do what they think it does. <laughs> It's not good enough, you know? So I became obsessed with this, like I said. And after the book came out, okay, so I'm a young man. I, I'm The book, come, I'm just turning 30 years old, uh, living in New York. It's a snowy day in February. Um, I've been told that the book, there's a write-up on my book and page six of the New York Post. So New York Post is the yellow journalism New York paper. Now it's the very conservative, slightly yellow journalism paper. And page six was the gossip column. And I've written a book about high energy physics. And the headline is Egghead Squabble Over Nobel Prize. And in the article, this Nobel laureate, I had actually gone to Stockholm with him when he won the Nobel Prize. We had gotten fitted for our black tie and tails together, something I'm sure he regrets to this day. <laughs> anyway, he is quoted in the paper calling me an asshole. Okay? Oh, God. And I'm a 30-year uh, journalist. I'm thinking I'm never yeah. going to work in journalism again. And what it turns out is that as I go back to my job writing about other subjects and I tell people about this Nobel laureate and the physics fiasco I've written about. And they say, oh, well, if you think he's bad, you should write about so-and-so. And it turns out in every field of science, every discipline has somebody who's gotten very far in the field by playing fast and loose with the facts, who's sort of got the mentality of a Hollywood movie producer, not a scientist. Yes. And I started, suddenly I had this career doing investigative science journalism. And then when my second book was about this great scientific fiasco called Cold Fusion, it was the fiasco of the sort of late 20th century. Um, basically, you put heavy water in a beaker with a platinum electrode and you turn it in and you 
plug it into the wall and you get fusion power. And complete bollocks, as the British would say. And anyway, I, that book was called Bad Science. I interviewed about 300 people for that one book. I mean, it was a great science writer named Horace Friedland Judson who used to say that I had done more research for the stupidest scientific subject than anyone in history. Um, after I was done with that book, I had a lot of fans in the physics community, people who didn't like the Nobel laureate that I was exposing in my first book. And um, they said, if you are interested in bad science, which was the title of the Cold Fusion book, you should look at the shit in public health. It's terrible. And they had one particular subject in mind, which was this idea that electromagnetic fields from power lines would cause brain cancer, leukemia. Now it's still kind of alive as the idea that your cell phones will do it. If you put them you know, in the wrong pocket, you'll be sterile for life, that kind of thing. Um, the listener wants to know, is it true? No, um, not as far as I could tell. I mean, the science is terrible and the physics would say it's impossible if you believe physics, which I tend to do, um, the laws of physics. So Anyway, that was it. That was my shift. I wrote an article for The Atlantic about electromagnetic fields and power lines, and I had my first introduction to the field of observational epidemiology. So that's the field where you, you know, find people who are like people who eat a lot of meat, for instance, and you compare them to people who don't eat a lot of meat, and you see who's got more disease and who dies earlier. Um, I was stunned at how sloppy the science was. So from the first seven years or so of studying bad science, I had all these brilliant experimentalists, really, really smart, talented men and women teaching me about how meticulous and rigorous and critical and skeptical you have to be because otherwise you'll fool yourself and embarrass yourself. And then I went into this field of epidemiology where they said, oh, well, we don't, we can't really it's just too much of a luxury. We can't be meticulous and we can't be rigorous. So we're not going to be skeptical and we're just going to assume we're not fooling ourselves. I was kind of stunned by this revelation. So I wrote uh, an article for the journal Science on epidemiology that, that was sort of infamous at the time. I was, I didn't realize it, but I was among a, a uh, for the 1990s, I became the leading critic of this field of observational epidemiology. There had been another fellow in the 1980s, since 2000s, John Ioannidis at Stanford has been that person. Um, and then I stumbled into diet. But by this point, I was comfortable working with the tools of nutritional science. I knew what it took to it achieve a reliable result in an experiment. I knew how careful you had to be. I've seen how easy it was to screw up, effortless. Um, by this point, I was used to talking to the graduate students because I figured they wouldn't lie to me. So if I would do a story about a some quote discovery, I would interview everyone, not just the investigator who's the last name on the paper, the first name on the paper, but all the people in between. And if there were technicians who were thanked, I would try to get the technicians on the phone to see what they thought. So this was just, um, it was time consuming and, but it, and it gets you in trouble too. That's the other, you don't make friends. Well, you You're make probably friends. Less, probably less in trouble now. Um, because what's what's so shocking as a as a physician um, who did clinical research uh, and was in practice and is in practice, we still rely so heavily on epidemiology as if it is somehow the result, you know, that it's proving something rather than it potentially being just a hypothesis and really low quality data. You must be shocked. I am. It's not so much that I'm shocked. <laughs> Um. Thank you to Thesis for sponsoring this episode of the show. I will never recommend something that I don't use or take myself. Thesis is a nootropic company. And what's a nootropic? Nootropics are compounds typically found in nature that really help 
individuals with things like clarity, mood, energy. This is exactly why I use thesis. I use a whole bunch of different formulas, but clarity is the one that I am on to lately. And in clarity, it comes in one little packet. There is lion's mane mushroom, alpha GPC, caffeine, alpheanine, all things that are clinically tested to help improve clarity and cognition. Head over to takethesis.com slash Dr. Lion, and there will be a quiz for you to take in which they will curate your very own custom box. That's takethesis.com slash Dr. Lion. They have compiled thousands and thousands of data points so that you will get your perfect match. The it has there was a period at which I mean this is a field that is constantly challenged, constantly accused by influential researchers of being, as you put it, not just low quality data, but very low quality data. And yet it is guaranteed to show up in the newspapers whenever somebody does it. I mean, I was just reading an article today in the Wall Street Journal about the benefits of exercise for Oh, maybe it was a pancreatic cancer story. So you take people, you get 6,000 people, and you follow them for 10 years, I think it was seven years, and you look at, see which ones get in better shape and which ones get in worse shape over that seven years. And then you see how that affects pancreatic cancer risk or colon cancer, colon cancer, colon cancer risk. And you find out that the people who got in better shape have a 35% lower risk of colon cancer. Um, their mortality is the same, meaning they died at the same rate and at the same times, but they had less colon cancer. So the reporter wrote it up. This might have been the New York Times, um, as though this study showed that exercise, getting in better shape, will reduce the risk of colon cancer, which is not what it showed. What it showed is that people who get in better shape have a lower risk of colon cancer. But then you're left with this idea that maybe the people who got in better shape over those seven years were different than the people who got in worse shape. So they might have been healthier to begin with. That's, they might have been more health conscious to begin with. There's a lot of reasons why people would get in better shape, why they would work out. And the reason you do randomized controlled trials, the reason that's high quality evidence, is because you take all those possible different reasons and you randomize them such that the people who you're now going to tell to work out, the people who aren't going to be told to work out, you could assume are identical. Without randomization, you can't do it. So this study that was written up in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, whatever it was, is simply incorrect in its interpretation. And nobody pointed this out to the journalist. And the journalist who's very well accomplished, had no apparent knowledge that people like me had ever been criticizing this kind of interpretation of the evidence. Hmm. So it's in some ways, it's getting worse because the longer we go without the good clinical trials, the good experiments, the more people, everyone involved is willing to accept this low quality data. How do you think that this col colors society's view on health and wellness? Most of what we believe is based on these epidemiologic surveys, because as, as I'm always writing and, and my colleague Nina Teicholz is writing and others, and when you actually do the experiments, we can never confirm these hypotheses. Um, but most of what we believe about a healthy diet, about the need, and again, I'm a, like you, I'm a physical activity nut. I go crazy if I don't get to work out every day. It's, I, you know, makes me feel better. I have no idea if it's going to make me live longer. Well, if you have muscle, you might. I would like to think so, but I also have, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, again, I was a football player when I was younger. I had a brief, uh, ill-conceived amateur boxing career. And so most of my physical ailments today are the results of physical exercise. You could argue that they were the wrong physical activities to do. They're not physical activities I'm letting my kids do. <laughs> but Good, no um, boxing. Yeah, that was, um, but when, you know, when you're 
21, 23, 25 years old, that stuff for a man seemed, you don't care how long you're going to live when you're that young because you feel like you're immortal. You don't care if you're going to be able to remember your cat's name when you're 67 because <laughs> you don't have a cat when you're 23. It's sort of... Um, That's right. Yeah. So these... Are there any recent studies or developments in the field of nutrition that have really caught your eye lately? And I do want to talk about your book because I really have to commend you. One of the things that I absolutely love about your work is it challenges everything. And humans are funny. If we hear something repeated over and over again, we believe it as truth, even if it's not. It's just the repetition somehow makes it true to us. And maybe it's the familiarity or that nobody questions the model. Um, you know, it seems like every day there's a new epidemiology study coming about how red meat is bad for us, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these things always pique my interest. And I'm curious if there's any recent studies or developments that have piqued your interest. Well, the, <clears throat> the obesity drugs, but that wasn't the, the – um, my assumption – in general is, well, let me give you the context. So again, when I was doing the work I was doing in the late 80s and through the 90s, I had to learn a lot about science and the philosophy of science and the history of science to understand whether I was crazy or not, right? Because I'm so critical and skeptical of what's being done. Um, and when you start reading this sociology of science and history of science, you realize that, it, like I said, it, the, the, the accepted wisdom is that the great bulk of everything that's done is meaningless. And today, it almost has to be meaningless because, for instance, you know, we have tens of thousands of medical journals. Uh, many of them have to pay people or people have to pay to submit articles on um, every professor who's got graduate students who are going to become PhDs or MDs have to get papers published for those students so they can get their degrees. Um, the amount of noise generated is enormous. Yeah. And so the question is, and the problem is, you know, the way the news works, and I've written about this in the past, newspaper reporters are supposed to report about the news and the news is what just happened. So they're reporting the front edge of scientific research, the sort of the noise is going up and down. It's like if you've ever looked at the Wall Street Journal and they tell you that that day, you know, the stock market has gone up 0.32 uh, percent and it's because and they always give you a reason uh, if it's gone up, it's because interest rates are down or they have really no idea why it's gone up and down because it's just fluctuating. But that's what they have to say every day. And you see the same phenomenon in science. So and one of my favorite quotes of this effect was an Australian uh, former physicist turned philosopher of science named Zeman, who said the physics, the science in the textbooks is 95% wrong and the science or 90% is wrong and the science in the the textbooks. The science in the journals is 90% wrong. The science in the textbooks is 90% right. And the job of the science is to find the right stuff that's being published and then figure out that it's really right. And then eventually it shows up in the textbooks, maybe 10 or 20 years later. But in the meantime, it's been in the newspapers and reported over and over again. So in general, I tend not to believe to take pay much attention to anything in the recent news other than to be horrified by how it's being reported with such certainty. Um, the, you know, as you know, I'm a, a, a proponent. I have come through my research to be a strong proponent of carbohydrate restricted diets. So, and you see more and more clinical trials every day reporting on those. And there's some very interesting findings, like particularly the field of metabolic psychiatry, which is brand new, where there's, you know, anecdotal and small clinical trial evidence that ketogenic diets have remarkable efficacy for some pretty awful cognitive disorders like bipolar disease. And, but I remain skeptical. As is your nature. As is my nature, yeah. As is your nature until it is true. And, and well, until it's just hard to figure out why you should continue to remain skeptical. Um, mm. 
but even with my skepticism, I could say to people, as I do in my books, look, here's a guy who was living on the streets. One of the the funding in this field of metabolic psychiatry comes from the Bazuki family in California because their son was bipolar and suffered from bipolar and schizophrenia and was homeless and in and out of prisons. I mean, this was a kid who was, I think he was at Stanford when he dropped out and was so uh, burdened by this disease that he couldn't function. And then eventually, I mean, he was on 20, 30 different drugs, and eventually they um, got him home and transitioned him to a ketogenic diet. And since then, he's had a somewhat remarkable recovery. You can't swear that the diet did it. Maybe it was a coincidence. Maybe he would have recovered anyway, or if he had gone vegan, that would have worked. You don't know. But you can say to people, look, it worked for him. It worked for Matt Bazuki. Maybe it will work for you. Give it a try. Is there anything that you feel as if you know? And I say that cautiously because you're always challenging what you're thinking and what you're doing. I know you love exercise, but you know, you've been in journalism, gosh, for how many decades now? At too least many. four and <laughs> we'll a half. We'll keep it at least too many. And um, I am curious as to are there a handful of things that you believe to be true or at least undeniable? And has your thinking evolved since your earlier works? So, you know, you've had good calories, bad calories, why we get fat, the case against sugar, the case for keto, and now rethinking diabetes. I'm just waiting for your case for muscle. I'm hoping that that's your next book. But um, is there something that's evolved since your earlier works or you consider a, a new research finding and debate in the field or something that has changed your personal perspective? Well, okay, so let's, it's because before I did the research, I was the follower of the conventional wisdom, okay, as many of us were. So this was the 1990s. I lived on a very low fat diet. I'm guessing it was probably less than 20% fat. Um, like, God forbid, I should ever eat the skin of a chicken. Um, the uh, I believe the conventional wisdom. I believe that we got fat because we took in more calories than we expend. I believe that heart disease was caused by eating too much saturated fat, that if I ate red meat, I'd get colon cancer. My mother had told me that in the 60s. Um, so the more and more research I did, all of that changed. Now, the very first book I wrote, Good Calories, Bad Calories, was four, five years of work, four years of research, and interspersed with two years of writing. Um, it was in that research, I delved into virtually every subject I've written about since then. So that was sort of the beginning of everything I was doing. So there was, there were no claims. I mean, the book is rife with errors. I hate to admit it. Um, I, my estimate is that there's 500 pages and another 150 pages of uh, footnotes and bibliography. There's probably 200 from very minor to some very embarrassing mistakes, errors that I should not have made. Um, and, um, Gary, Gary, I have to stop you. You know, every writer feels that way. I would like to think so. And occasionally... Every writer feels that way, cringes when they read their book, including myself. So, Well, this is, it. if you were going to ask me which book I like, well, yeah. Uh, I'm anyway. asking you, which book do you... Wait, which, wait, hold on. You're not off the hook. Each book must have taken you... How long did each book take you? Well... Good calories, bad calories was five years, but plus the two years previous in which I was doing the research on salt and dietary fat for a science investigation. So arguably the better part of seven years. Um, the Why We Get Fat was written specifically, as I say in the introduction, to be a easily digestible, aka readable version of good calories, bad calories, because so many people had written me saying this book had changed my life. Would you now please write one that like my husband could read or my father could read or my doctor could read? I had doctors writing me saying this book changed my life. Could you please write one that's 
my patients could read because they're not going to get through this. So why we get fat was relatively easy. Um, maybe a year of writing. There wasn't a lot of new research ah. on it. If, hmm. uh, the sugar book was um, probably, well, again, that was research that was done from sort of 2008 onward, but maybe in total three years of work. Um, the case for keto was a book I probably could have written without any research at all, but that concept made me very nervous. I ended up interviewing 120 odd physicians and another 20 or so dietitians and nutritions and chiropractors who had sort of shifted to my way of thinking so I could benefit from how they thought about it because they were doctors. Like you're, you know, they did treat patients, and so they would have a different and, in many ways, a better perspective. So that was probably a year and a half to two years total, and then the diabetes book was another three years. But again, always built on, as I say in the diabetes book, I'm unpacking subjects that. I might have touched on in a single paragraph in Good Calories, Bad Calories, but deserve a far denser treatment. The cool thing about the diabetes book, well, all of this work, you know, the advantage I had over anyone who came. So the people who were challenging conventional wisdom before me were just, they were basically physicians who were trying to get their patients to lose weight and they weren't making any progress with the conventional wisdom and then stumbled on carbohydrate restriction or Atkins or protein power, sugar busters, whatever you want to call it, and realize that that worked for their patients and it worked usually for them. So they wrote diet books. Um, I was the first journalist to really delve into it. And I came along at a time where the internet made it possible to find virtually all of the relevant literature. So back between when I was doing good calories, bad calories, 2002 to 2007, I had um, actually undergraduates that I had hired in New York and Boston and, and Los Angeles. And their jobs were basically to get an email from me with 50 references I needed. And then they would go to their local medical school and they'd have to you know, get the pull the books and Xerox it, and then they'd send me a box with however many of the 50 references they could get. Mm. And I had filing cabinets, and I kept buying new filing cabinets. And um, so I was able to do in five years what would have taken 30 or 40 years previously, because it would have required me sitting in medical school libraries with my stack of quarters or my, you know, card I had bought. And um, now I could get all of that in five years. Today, you can download it all. Thank you to Element for sponsoring this episode of the show. It's spelled L-M-N-T and it's pronounced Element. I've been using Element for a handful of years. It really helps me maintain hydration, especially when I'm traveling and also embarrassingly so I don't get dry mouth before any kind of speaking engagement. I love my Element and I also put it in my iced tea. It contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio. That's 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. And here's the thing. Let's say you don't feel dehydrated. Maybe it's subtle. Maybe you have a headache or you're getting muscle cramps. Two other reasons why Element could be very valuable for you. Right now, Element is offering my listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packets free with any Element order. It's a great way to try all eight flavors. Go to drinklmnt.com slash Dr. Lion. That's drink element.com slash Dr. Lion, you will get a no questions asked refund if you don't like it. So it's totally risk-free. Well, you found some things that I, I uh, was very surprised at and I think is often difficult to find. Just diving into some of the content of your rethinking diabetes, you talk a lot about the history, the history of um, how diabetes was treated, the first person that was given insulin, this farmer, and then just getting the historical perspective, I think can be challenging. But I would love for you, you know, to just help us understand a little bit of the history. You talk also about um, this letters to Rollo and 
this idea of this animal di- based diet that was seen by patients and uh, you know just things that are probably at that time very unusual so if you have a moment I, I would love a little quick history lesson that again people should certainly pick up your book and read it because it's extraordinarily well written but there's some interesting historical perspectives in here yeah so I mean the question at one point, why would you do this today? 2024, why bother with the history? And so I'm trying to answer, I have a bias going into this, right? Because already I'm pretty convinced that, that ketogenic diets are can put type 2 diabetes into remission. So that's a pretty remarkable observation that's not getting enough attention by the medical community. So that that's my bias going in. But simultaneously, you want to understand like certain points in time when things happen. So for instance, in 1971, the American Nutrition, uh, the American Diabetes Association puts out their first dietary guidelines, and they recommend that um, patients with diabetes get more than half of their calories from the one macronutrient, carbohydrates, that they can't metabolize safely without pharmaceutical help. So they can eat protein to some extent. They can eat all the fat they want, and they'll be fine. But as soon as they eat carbs, they have to take drugs. And I don't actually think the American Diabetes Association was trying to sell drugs, but I want to understand what their mentality was. And so you have to look at the data they cite and then go back in time. So you pull those references. So cite this study and that study, and you pull those references, and those references may or may not support what the ADA is saying, but those references also have references. And they're, so you just keep going back and back in time through these references. And eventually you get to 1797, which is crazy, which was the very first successful, the very first time a physician successfully treated a case of diabetes. So um, Back in the 19th and much of the 20th century, the 19th century and the 18th century, when diabetes would only appear when people were very far along in the disease state. So, you know, today we're going to diagnose it based on your hemoglobin A1C or your blood sugar level, and you may have zero symptoms. But they didn't do that prior to the 1970s. So... Do you either get a diagnosis when you went to the doctor and they did a urine test and saw you had sugar in your urine, or you were manifesting the symptoms of the disease? So you were hungry all the time, you were thirsty all the time, you were losing weight, you were, might be emaciated, you might be you know, uh, weak and unable to, to actually walk, and then you'd show up in the doctors. And this uh, British Army Colonel Meredith shows up to see this British Army doctor, John Rollo, and Rollo decides if there's sugar in the urine, maybe Meredith, this is a, only the second case of diabetes he's seen in 20 years. The disease was that rare. So he decides maybe Meredith can't metabolize the carbohydrates in the diet. He just thinks of them as a plant food that he's eating. So he puts them on a non-plant food diet. A, they called it the animal diet back when Rollo did it, it was fatty, rancid meat and blood sausages. I know, I saw that. Disgusting. Disgusting. But Meredith got better. And as long as he stuck to the diet, he stayed better. So Rollo writes up Meredith's case. He also treats another a general who also gets better on this diet. By that time, he had dropped the rancid meat and was just going for fatty meat. Um so no starches, no grains, no sugars, very little alcohol, um, basically a ketogenic diet, although they're not calling it that. They, and Rollo writes up his case study, and he distributes to this pamphlet to physicians throughout the United Kingdom. And nowadays, thanks to Google Books, you can get the pamphlet. You don't have to take anyone else's word for it. You could download it and read it. And then he did multiple editions because when he distributed it, he said, look, this diet seems to do wonders for diabetes. We never thought this was curable before. Can you try it on your patients? It's like beta testing. And tell me what happens. Write me back and let me know what happens. And a couple dozen physicians from around the UK write him back. And for the most part, people stick to the diet, the diabetes gets better or goes into remission. And Rollo publishes subsequent editions that you can download from Google Books reporting on what these doctors said. And then through the 19th century, 
this becomes what we would call today the standard of care. So diabetes is still a very rare disease. The physicians are kind of aware there's two different types. There's an acute kind that tends to hit children, what we would call type 1 today, that kills quickly. Like By the time they're diagnosed, it's pretty much a death sentence. And then there's the chronic form that associates with age and obesity, what we would call type 2. That could be put into remission by this animal diet. And the type 1 could be slowed down. It, kids would still die pretty quickly, but they would die slower if they didn't eat carbohydrates. Um, and when I say standard of care, every major diabetes specialist in the U.S. and Europe, and again, there's only a half dozen of them, when they're writing about this, this is a diet they're telling their patients to be on. There's, you know, like a British Frederick Pobby, the leading British diabetes specialist, says, you know, he gets his patients on these diets after a month or two. They like eating this way better than they eat anything else, and they get healthy. This Italian named Cantani used to lock his patients up for three, however long it took to make sure they didn't eat any, you know, fruits, bread, grains, starches, and only eat this fatty meat and green vegetables. A Frenchman, um, you know, being French, had to say, look, you could cook the green vegetables in butter, <laughs> and it makes everything much more palatable. The Germans swore by it. And by the end of the 19th century, because they're often dealing with patients with type 1 and not differentiating, they got these kids coming in who are emaciated. You want to fatten them up, right? That was the assumption. We want to put weight back on these people so that they'll have more strength and health. So we should give them as much calories as possible. And we can't give them carbs. And by 1860s, they know that some 60% of the amino acids and protein gets converted to um, glucose. So the body needs doesn't respond well to that with diabetes. So let's give them as much fat as possible. And now they're putting their patients on basically they're eating butter and heavy cream. And it's, you know, it's Atkins to the nth degree. <laughs> and the patients are, for the most part, thriving. Not the type 1 patients, but the type 2. And then um, skipping one period where they decide starvation is the best way to go, thanks to a misconceived Harvard doctor. And by the way, the reason I don't mention my Harvard degree and my Stanford degree in the is because when you spend your whole life saying, don't listen to authority figures, yeah, I don't want to try and convince anyone that I know what I'm talking about because oh, I went to Harvard or Stanford, right? It's sort of, um, especially when I know what bad science they've done at both those Can institutions. You, is it putting you on the spot to mention that? Because would that be, I mean, I'm sure that you've spoken about it, but quite frankly, I'm often surprised by certain pieces of literature that come out of the Ivy League, just absolutely floored. The Harvard School of Public Health, and this is an issue we could get into because it's right in the meat versus plant debate. Um, the Harvard School of Public Health pioneered the field of nutritional epidemiology. Um, yes. Prior to the nurses' health study um, at Harvard, and which was started as a test of um, oral contraceptives uh, and cancer, and then was transitioned by this guy, Walter Willett, into a nutritional study. Nobody know, had really I done that. I've seen kind his of literature, thing. and I have seen him speak uh, often. Yeah. You know, he's um, an interesting character. We are, weirdly, to his credit, we've co-authored articles together, even though I had a front page New York Times magazine the cover story that criticized his work specifically. Um, but anyway, the point is they sort of pioneered the science of nutritional epidemiology. And the, you know, you and I know that what these studies do is they identify associations between foods and diseases, but the associations are only can only generate hypotheses. But the reason they do those studies is because they want to establish the cause. So they want them to imply causality. And the longer the studies go and the more they've built their career on this, the more they feel confident because they've been telling people the same thing for decades. So people have started to believe it. They believe it's true. And then they 
kind of uh, in their whole career gets invested in this one type of experiment, the non-experimental. A non-experiment, as opposed to taking the epidemiology, taking the hypothesis and testing it against a randomized control trial. Exactly. And, but the problem is when they've done that, the randomized control trials very rarely support their hypothesis. So then they have to decide it's, you get trapped. You can, just as you can get trapped into a belief system, you could get trapped into a sort of experimental methodology or a scientific methodology. That is, is that why, not to interrupt you, but is that what you mean by pathological science? Um, pathological science. So that term coined by a, another a Nobel laureate chemist named Irving Langmuir is the science of things that aren't so. And one of the themes there always, I mean, it means that you're misinterpreting something you see. So you're seeing something that has a mundane explanation and you're assuming and then disseminating the the idea that you've discovered something novel and interesting about the universe. And it's always based on uh, ultimately a misinterpretation of what your scientific method, uh, technique can do. I mean, it's funny when, and this is where the my history comes in. When, when I was writing about high energy physics and living at CERN, the physics lab, so they have this atom smasher, which is this huge ring that circulates and that case protons and antiprotons and then smashes them together at certain points on the ring. And at those points where they collide, you build these, they're called detectors, but they're like mansion size cameras. And so this, these particles collide and they throw out the shower of debris and these detectors capture the debris. So what kind of particles came out? How fast were they going? What was their momentum in this direction and that direction? Ideally, you see everything that's like you imagine smashing cars together and then having a box around the cars that says, well, the part of a fender went off here and a part of the light went off there and the body part went this way and the body part weighed seven pounds and the fender weighed 2.3 pounds. Um, you got to know if what you detector is telling you is what's really happening. So you have to be able to calibrate your equipment. That's like rule number one that Nobel laureate I wrote about, who was a brilliant guy, even as he got so many things wrong, used to say, you got to know if you set it at zero, are you really seeing zero? Or are you, it's like you get on a scale, right, in the morning, and you weigh four pounds more than you thought you did. So the first thing you do is you, you calibrate the scale, you, you get off the scale, and you see if it reads zero when you're not standing on it. And if it doesn't, then you adjust the little knob or whatever the electronic scales have. And then you get back on and hope that your four pounds are going to go away. But the absolutely crucial thing is knowing that when you're not on it, it's showing zero. Because if it's showing something um, in nutritional epidemiology, the detectors are these cohorts of people. So 130,000 nurses in the nurses' health study, 30,000 of them get diet. Uh, surveys. And every year or two years or four years, you have them fill out the surveys about what they're eating, and then you get their medical reports about their disease states, and then you're doing these associations. But the idea is... Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the show. Blood work is important, guys. We can exercise, eat right, but you got to know if you're being effective. And this is why I love Inside Tracker. Inside Tracker allows you to get data on a whole host of individual biomarkers from your blood. It provides a personalized plan to improve your metabolism, improve sleep. It is also created by leading scientists in aging, genetics, biometrics. It analyzes your blood, DNA, and fitness tracking data. Not too shabby if you ask me. Here is the thing. Again, you're doing all the things right, but you do need to take the time to get your blood work done and analyze what is going on inside. Also, Inside Tracker is offering Inside Tracker Pro, which enables coaches and health professionals to provide premium and personalized services by leveraging Inside Tracker's analysis and recommendations with their clients. So, 
please go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. That's insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion for 20% off. How do you calibrate that detector? So the nurses and the surveys and it's all this, the equivalent of the physics detector looking at the collisions. And how do you know if you set it at zero that it's really zero? And they can't do that. They've never been able to do it. There's no way to do it. That's why you do randomized control trials, because then you can take all these other possible explanations for why when you step on the scale, it shows, or when you're not on the scale, it shows a pound. You get rid of all that. So um, anyway, getting back to Harvard, the Harvard people, just that was their career. That was the, what made them famous. That's how why Walter Willard is the most highly cited scientist in nutrition. It's why you become head of your department and you get awards and you speak everywhere. And it's why we're so familiar with them. But if it's built on a fundamental misconception about what his detector can do, he's, what does he do about that knowledge? You know, how many of us can say, you asked earlier if I changed my opinion, let's say I was definitively wrong and I could tell you about the thing I believe and I, I'm often, uh, he, because I say I'll never change my mind on this, people say, well, that proves Taubes is biased. And I would say it proves Taubes is honest, <laughs> 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 which is the most important thing because um, all of us are biased. Um, anyway, the... Um, you invest your whole life in this, and then it turns out to be you were wrong. And not only were you wrong, everything you wrote is meaningless. That's the implication. If that were the case, then I'm just hoping an individual would course correct that. You can build your career on something, but there it seems as if to now begin to do randomized control trials. Say, for example, um, an, right, an Ivy League group believed that the plant-based diet was going to move health and wellness forward, then they would do a randomized control trial. Yes, it would be very expensive, but maybe we choose a handful of health markers that are meaningful and we execute on that. And so then that way, there would be proof of a hi hypothesis, or at least even if the study isn't highly powered, maybe it's a small study, uh, at least it begins to prove a concept or unprove a concept. And, and I, um you know, yeah, that's what I argue, and that's why I co-founded Newsy with my former buddy Peter Atia. But there is, um, you know, these people—they're not clinical trialists, so that's a different skill. And they're they're epidemiologists, so that that's one problem. They don't do these kind of studies. They should certainly argue for them to be done. But as I said, in every case where they have been done, and when they did this in the past, the studies failed to confirm the hypothesis generated by their associations. So they were stuck in this position. Do we believe the studies or do we believe what we've been doing our whole lives? And like most people, they decided to believe that what they were doing their whole lives was right. And so these studies can't be trusted. And there are reasons always to distrust, as I said in the beginning, most of what is done in science is wrong. So maybe these studies are wrong. So it's just, it's this terrible place to be. And I feel for them. My mm -hmm. first book, Bad Science, about cold fusion and these the two professors at the University of Utah who claim this remarkable discovery. I mean, they destroyed their lives. The worst thing that could ever happen to them. And then the rest of their lives, they had to pretend that they believed it because it was the only way they could save what they thought of as their dignity. The reality is, as scientists, you should be able to say, look, I was wrong. I admit it. But when it's yeah. your whole life? Well, I don't know. So I, um, I don't know if you know this, but my longtime mentor uh, doc is Dr. Donald Lehman. I, I don't know if you knew that, but he's trained I me. I did for not. Okay, so he's... Uh, he, of course, knows you. Um, he trained me for 20 years. My recent book is dedicated to him from all of the things that he has taught me and continues to teach me. And he will always say that uh, there has to be intellectual integrity to the, the best of an individual's capacity. And there are many studies that he has done where he said, well, this just doesn't show what we were hoping it was going to show. But that doesn't mean that it was ignored. He's 
pretty strict on that. And, you know, just looking at the history of your, your book, it seems as if, um, there's been so many ups and downs where there was a lot of evidence for what looks like a carbohydrate restricted diet, but that was often ignored. Um, you know, I, I would love to ask you, is there a, a turning point in history that from writing this book, from this historical perspective, that you think perhaps we could have gone a different cho- a different way? Maybe it was the the next iteration of the dietary guidelines. Is was there a turning point that you, you feel like because of the injection of either researchers or um, funding or politics that we went the wrong way? Well, there were a lot of turning points. Um, I used to joke that I could never write this, but for instance, that you know the obesity epidemic was caused by Hitler um, because the German Austrian research community had come to believe that obesity was not an energy balance problem; it was a um, constitutional sort of neuro hormonal disorder. So people are born predisposed to become obese. And they don't get that way just by eating too much or exercising too little. And then in 1930, this American a guy named Louis Newberg from the University of Michigan came along and said, oh, no, 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 I proved it's all about eating too much. Here's my six studies. And he said it definitively and dogmatically. And by that time, the German and Austrian community was already beginning to evaporate under the, the emergence of the Nazi party. And with the Second World War, that evaporated completely. And the German language uh, medical literature, which had been German, had been the lingua franca of medical science until World War II. If you wanted to do cutting edge medical science, you had to be able to read German. And ideally, you spoke German and you had gone to Germany or Austria to work with these great mm. scientists and in their institutions, which we had none of those in the United States. Well, a couple, but... Um, Anyway, so this whole idea of obesity is a constitutional disorder that people are preordained, but just like an elephant is preordained to be fatter than a giraffe. Some humans are preordained to put on excess body fat, and there may be very little they can do about it. But if you believe that obesity is caused by eating too much, you tell them to eat less and exercise, or you say the diet that works is the one that gets them to eat less, and then you give them the wrong advice, and you go from there. So it's sort of that, if that had never happened, if World War II had never happened, if the Nazis had not emerged, and many of these researchers were Jewish, so they were, you know, either had to stop researching, or they came to the U.S. where they got like minor positions because nobody wanted to deal with these Jewish academics unless they were physicists and could help them build a bomb. If that hadn't happened, that's the first place it goes awry. The second place. And wait, before, like, before you continue, I, I want to read a passage from your book because um, I, I really loved what you said. And basically what he had said was all obesity is simple obesity. And he talks about how, um, I just had it here. It was so good. It was basically something like emotional intolerance, uh, perverted appetite, he called it. And so not by a constitutional or endocrine disorder. There is no specific metabolic abnormality in obesity. Yeah, no, it's, um, I mean, that's what people wanted to hear, basically. We all had this, we had a, uh, uh, preconception of what makes people fat. Um, doctors had it, researchers had it. It's like all it takes is to see one character like Shakespeare's Falstaff sitting in a restaurant eating a lot of food, and you know that he got fat because he ate so much food. And we don't tend to think, our brains don't tend to reverse causality very easily. We don't think, well, maybe he's eating that much and he's that hungry because his body is trying to get fat. We just see the the obvious. Um, so, and yeah, this one guy, Newberg, basically. Um, and what's fascinating, and this is going to be in the next book, and it's probably going to bore people senseless, but... Um, as you watch the 20s and 30s as it progresses, and like I said, now I could get virtually every study 
published in both German and English, and I could use ChatGPT, God love it, to translate the German. I mean, it's crazy what we have access to now in 2024. And you could see how people were influenced not just by Newberg's work, but by their misinterpretation of earlier work mm. or the, for instance, the edition they cited of a particular textbook. So one of the most influential people in this field was a German uh, pediatrician named Hilda Brook, who did these studies of obese kids and their families, uh, famous studies. And she interpreted what she saw as these kids getting fat because their parents are overfeeding, their mothers are overprotective and overfeeding them. And she knew there was an alternative way to think about it. The kids were preordained to get fat and that it screwed up. The mothers couldn't stop it. So that screwed up their relationship and how the mothers treated the children. Um, and she wrote about that, but then she cited these papers, this textbook chapter, saying that obesity is caused by eating too much. And that was a 1926 German textbook. She probably brought it with her when she fled Germany in 1933 and moved first to Boston and then to New York. But there was a newer edition of the textbook, might have been available only in Germany, that had completely switched from eating too much to constitutional hormonal disorder. Mm -hmm. Had she had that newer edition, which was already eight years old, she interprets her data differently. If she interprets her data differently, everyone who comes after interprets their data differently. It was all based on her and this guy Newberg, and then the first guy to write about these animal experiments. It was like uh, crazy. These so this, tiny this brings me uh, this. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. There's a little bit of a delay. It it makes me wonder. Clearly, there is dynamic personalities and uh, historically dynamic personalities that make bold claims that then generate, whether it's standard of care or lack of standard of care, what challenges, um, I guess this is a two-part to the question, what challenges or barriers do you anticipate in reshaping the narrative around this diabetic, per, um, diabetic parameter or narrative? Because clearly from your book, you believe and there is evidence for carbohydrate restriction. Um, so number one, what barriers do you think we're up against? And number two, for the healthcare providers, for the professionals, for the individuals who are just lay public listening to this, how can they contribute to this paradigm shift? Well, they can buy my book and give it to their doctors. Um, not that they shouldn't read it themselves, but it's like I said, it's more a medical history than it is. It's certainly not a, a self-help book. The um, okay, so let me give you go back. It's a bad habit. I am going to give it a little bit of history again. Just uh, two ways. So until 1921, with the discovery of insulin, the only lever that physicians could pull with their patients to control their blood sugar was dietary. You want to. Key, and they didn't measure blood sugar, but you want to keep them healthy. You tell them, look, you can't metabolize these foods. Don't eat them. And if you don't eat them, you won't manifest symptoms of the disease and you'll be relatively fine. Um, and then you get a drug therapy, insulin. It's this extraordinarily powerful drug. It's so powerful. It lowers blood sugar so easily that now you have to tell people to start eating carbohydrates to protect them from the drug therapy. <laughs> which right. will kill them otherwise. So they call it insulin shock or insulin overdose, which was basically hypoglycemic episodes, low blood sugar that could kill people. So beginning in 1922, you start, you take the one food that they, you would tell people not to eat. And now you tell them they have to eat it. And doctors find out that the more and more they eat it, the more they could give them more and more insulin and they'll be kind of happier. And they have no idea the long-term risks or benefits, but in the short term, particularly with kids, if you let them eat whatever they want, give them the drug. So since 1922, that's basically been our philosophy. Use drug therapy to control the disease symptoms and pay lip service to diet. And the alternative has always been, look, this is a disorder where you cannot metabolize the carbohydrates that you're consuming without drug therapy. If you don't eat the carbs, you don't need the drug therapy. Right. Okay, pretty simple 
concept. The way it was phrased to me, it was encapsulated. I was interviewing myself, this chef turned journalist, um, interested because he had interviewed me first about my sugar book. And then he said, by the way, I have type one diabetes myself. And I said, oh, well, I'm doing a book on diabetes. I would like to interview you for that. So I did. Yeah. So he described he's when he was diagnosed in 2017, he was 36 years old. And when you're diagnosed, particularly with type one diabetes, suddenly you're like thrust into disease land. Like you may never have thought about this disease in your life unless some relative or friend had it. Now you've got to learn everything about it as fast as you can and you have no preconceptions. So his doctor explains to him, look, you know, you don't make enough insulin. Your pancreas is going to run out of insulin and you need the insulin to metabolize these carbohydrates. Without them, your blood sugar will be too high and you have all these chronic complications. So we want you to continue eating the carbohydrates, but you're going to eat, you know, a measured amount at every meal and snack. And then we can dose the insulin to that. And you know, and then we're going to get a diabetes educator to teach you all about this. And he says to the doctor, wait a minute. What you're telling me is that because of this disease, carbohydrates are not toxic to me. And insulin is the antidote. And you want me to eat the toxin and take the antidote? Why don't I just not eat the toxin? And the doctor is like stunned by this. He's never thought about that. And then he starts giving all kinds of, well, that's really hard to do. You're never going to be able to keep it up. Nobody complies. But that's always been the sort of alternative therapy. This is a disorder that only manifests itself in response to the carbohydrates in the diet. We don't need to eat carbohydrates. We know from the last 20 years of clinical trials that not eating them is safe, if not the healthiest way to eat, depending on how you want to interpret those trials. And we now know that if patients with type 2 diabetes don't eat the carbohydrates, they will, most of them will go into remission and not need drugs. So why don't we at least tell patients that that's a viable option? And in order to do that, we need the doctors to understand it. So that gets back to your question, the challenge. And the reason I wrote this book is to get the physicians and the diabetes educators and the diabetes associations to rethink the title, Rethinking Diabetes, and say, look, a lot of people are just going to want drugs. We all love a good drug, you know? <laughs> but if given the choice between being on, you know, you think, okay, I'm going to start with one drug, but the other message you get is this is a chronic progressive disease that's going to get worse. So people who start with one drug, what used to be called monotherapy, in 10 years are going to be on two or three drugs. If their blood pressure goes up, they're going to be on blood pressure lowering drugs. If their LDL goes up, or even if it doesn't, they're going to be on statins. If they've gained weight, they're going to be on GLP-1 agonists. There are a lot of people, and then all these drugs have side effects and complications. You know, So maybe some people just want to do the not eat the carbohydrate thing, which means they're basically on a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet, or, you know, you could do it as a vegan diet, it's difficult. And being healthy is a better option than slowing the progression of the disease. And if I can get the physician community to understand that, and then they have to do their homework. They have to go down the rabbit hole and understand these diets. And now there's, you know, a gazillion books. We've all written them um, that'll help them understand it. And then when their next patient is diagnosed, they could say, we have these two options. The conventional way, the ADA way is, well, hopefully the ADA will be saying, that, you know, we're going to give you this drug and we're going to ask you to control your carb intake. And this other option is you're going to do this keto thing not eat the carbs and you'll probably lose 50 pounds and be feel better. And we won't ever have, we may never have to go to drug therapy and then let the patients decide, but the doctors have to be able to give them informed advice. I'd like to take a moment and thank one of the sponsors of the show. First form. If you are not eating your fruits and vegetables, then you should definitely try Opti Greens 50. OptiGreens 50 is packed with 50 
hand-chosen ingredients to help support gut health. It is a blend of natural fruits and vegetables and grasses to maximize the nutrients you get in every scoop. Some people don't like to eat a bunch of fruits and vegetables, even though there is a lot of data out there that having fruits and vegetables in your diet can be very beneficial. OptiGreens 50 includes a low temperature processed 100% organic grasses, non-GMO, non-synthetic botanical superfoods. I hate to use that term, but it's as close as you're going to get. Phytonutrients, digestive enzymes, postbiotic, probiotic, OptiGreens 50 blend is amazing. You can get yours. Please go to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. That's firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. And that and that's tough um, because again, just the nature of medical care is not. Uh, tr- I say it's not treatment based, but it's not it's not um, root cause based. I, I guess is a is a better way to put it. It's there's an issue. What's the fastest way to treatment? In an ideal world, what you would like to see is, and I'm just putting words in your mouth, is that you would see a carbohydrate restricted diet. And you said there's many ways to make it work, whether it's keto, carnivore, um, vegan, if they could do it with low carbohydrate, which seems pretty challenging. But in an ideal world, this would be an option is basically what I'm hearing you say, and that we need to get healthcare providers. We need to get wise consumers and individuals that because 100% of people eat and getting it done in that fashion. Yeah. And that's, I mean, none of this Every time there's a new drug, it makes it harder to get this message across. But the drugs are always treating symptoms. We have not invented the drug yet that cures this disease or cures obesity. Um, the yeah, it's just we, and it can all be tested. By the way, I mean Verda Health in San Francisco, as I discussed in the book, did a what I think is a pretty compelling trial showing that this diet can put diabetes into remission. It didn't show whether it was better than any other diet, but it did show that this one works and works in a way that nobody actually ever thought was possible. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the challenge now is, and that's what the book was written to try and to help nudge along um, because I recognize I'm not going to get rid of skepticism. Even the, one percent or zero point one percent of physicians who would make the effort to read a book like mine when they're done are not going. It's not going to remove their skepticism, but hopefully they will say to themselves, "This is interesting. Like, let me try it." I gave. I remember giving a, uh, a talk to a Cleveland Clinic uh, conference. I was at their Las Vegas. Uh, base. And um, I was talking right after lunch and I ate before my talk. And then I got to watch all the cardiologists at the meeting walk up to get the very nice lunch that was all, you know, salmon and skinless chicken breasts and vegetables. And, um, And I was watching them walk out and they definitely looked like the sort of typical distribution of overweight and obesity among the public, a significant amount of them were struggling. And mm-hmm. So try it yourself, learn what you can about it, understand it enough that you could communicate. I mean, the problem is if you're seeing a patient for 15 minutes, it's easier to write a prescription. Take this drug, I'll see you in a month, move on to the next patient. That's always going to be a problem. But then we have diabetes educators um, the nutritionists and dietitians. Um, I mean, it's crazy because this way of eating has now had more clinical trials testing it than any diet in history. And even the American Diabetes Association agrees it's better tested and more effective than any other diet that they promote. So they they're coming around as slowly as humanly possible because not in, especially a health association doesn't want to say oh by the way we made a mistake or phrase anything in such a way that somebody else might go wait a minute this is entirely different from what you were saying ten years ago, um, but uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, you've done a lot of 
great work in the world. And and I have to say, one of the things that I'm most grateful for is you're willing to step up and challenge. I'm sure that that always, that, that may not be easy and you certainly have to get extremely thick skin, but you're willing to do it for a greater purpose. Well, thank you. It, um, it's just, why, why do all this work? I mean, this is what everybody does this, right? You, you do the work and you come up with the idea and then you get, you go, well, wait a minute, nobody's listening to me. So then you go out there and try to get them to listen. I was lucky because I did have very, um, powerful soapboxes in the beginning of my career. So when I wrote something or spoke it, you know, people paid attention, but, um, it's important. That's the other thing. It's like, it would be great if all we cared about was keeping, you know, 30, 40 year old athletes healthy as long as humanly possible. But I, it's not really what my interest is. My interest is in helping all these people who are not healthy become healthy. And that's a different you know, there we have all these obstacles in our way, which include, unfortunately, the health associations. Yeah, which is wild. What did what would be your advice to individuals who are just trying to find a a way of eating? So they're certainly going to read your book. Um, but what other advice would you give them? Are there red flags that they should look out for in the general health landscape or providers, et cetera? Well, I think here's where context is so important. So, I mean, if you're young and healthy, and I am assuming, for instance, that if I never went on this crazy low-fat diet on the, in the 90s, when I was also getting a significant proportion of my calories from sugar because of either fruit or fruit juice or smoothies, all of which I thought were benign, and there was a period in my life when I thought, wouldn't it be a great idea to open a Jamba Juice uh you know, franchise in New York. <laughs> I had been living at Jamba Juice in LA. And then you realize later that these things are all different ways of sort of maximizing your sugar content of your diet. But I think of young men and women, um, you know, the, the generic conception of what a healthy diet is, isn't bad. And will keep many people healthy you know, they, they can tolerate it. So the whole fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, I don't go for the low fat part of it, but other than that, you know, legumes, if that's your thing, then, then it's working, keep doing it. Then if it, if it starts to go awry, if you start developing metabolic disorders, then the hope is you'd, fix your diet, which means going more and, you know, lower and lower in carbohydrates and the carbohydrates you do consume have to be slower and slower using Tim Ferriss's term. Um, you know, and if it becomes a real problem, then it's the, they basically keto minimizing insulin is the way to solve it. So it's, um, but it's all context dependent for me to tell a 25 year old marathon or that he should eat a ketogenic diet. I mean, I could do it, but why, why should he? Right. But if, if that, you know, the world is full of people um, who ate these healthy diets. So like Peter Atia was one and, and Sammy Inkin and the founder of Virta or other who were like fanatical athletes in extraordinary shape who became, you know, Peter famously gained 30 pounds on this diet and Sammy Inkinen became pre-diabetic despite working out hours and hours and hours a day. So at some point when it gets there, food is the le lever you're going to have to pull. More exercise is going to solve it. Different exercise is going to solve it. I do see the benefit of you know, um, of working out, like I said, and building muscle and having muscle and staying active. But at some point, I think, you know, we all, like I worked out, I, you know, it wasn't Sammy Peter level, but I worked out an hour a day. I was a writer. That was my social life, right? When you live in Los Angeles, you go to the gym or you run on the beach. You know, those are your options. There's no literary life to partake of so it's not like well, strolling down boulevards as you would in paris so um but it didn't stop and i was eating what i thought was a very healthy diet and it didn't stop me from gaining weight and i'm sure i was probably pre-diabetic or some such i didn't never checked but so well very 
very impressive repertoire of writing. Thank you so much for spending time chatting and your new book. You have many books, Rethinking Diabetes. We will link it here. I'm really grateful for the work you do. And I'm, I'm grateful that you challenge the way conventional thinking is done and hopefully conventional practice. Thank you again for having me.